Gods are a staple of D&D lore, whether it's directly impacting the story or just being a catalyst for the clerics and paladins of the world. They touch all aspects of your D&D campaign. Therefore, I thought it was sensible to make an early episode of my D&D guide all about the gods in the main books, as well as ideas for how to make your own gods too. So let's start with the examples that are in the book. This includes both good and the neutral gods, as well as evil gods, who are actually devils. I've already covered devils in last week's video, so if you're interested in those, please do check that out. Here today, I'll only be covering the good and neutral gods. So let's start with the examples of the good gods that are given. This starts with Avandra, who is the goddess of chance and luck. We then have Bahamut, god of justice and nobility, Corellon, the god of magic and the arts, Muradin, the god of creation, Pelor and Sehenin, who are the god and goddess of the sun and the moon. These range from lawful good to chaotic good, and that mostly depends on the nature of their domain. For example, Avandra, who represents luck, is chaotic good, whereas Bahamut, who represents justice, is lawful good, as you'd expect. We also have a roster of neutral gods that are provided to us. These are the ones that are focused on how the world works and treat all creatures fairly, regardless of whether they are good or bad. These neutral gods are Erathis, goddess of civilization and invention, Ayun, goddess of knowledge, Kord, god of strength and storms, Melora, goddess of the wilderness and the sea, and finally the Raven Queen, goddess of death. All of these make sense to be neutral, as most of these domains will help or harm creatures equally regardless of their actions. For example, all creatures will eventually die. Now these are the 11 gods and goddesses that the Dungeon Master's Guide has given you. But very often you may want to slightly adjust these gods for your world. I often find that these 11 are a good base for your world, but there is definitely scope to change them or have an entirely new pantheon. When it comes to making new gods though, there are four things I think you should think about. First is their domain. This may seem obvious, but in a world with multiple gods, it makes sense that each has a particular area that they focus on. In worlds I've played, there have been gods of luck, gods of time, goddesses of crafting, of war, of love, and of beauty, and a variety of other things. In effect, your gods can be the god or goddess of anything that you choose it to be. The second thing to consider is their alignment. This should be linked to their domain and gives an impression of how they act and what their teachings are. It can also give an idea as to how their domain is viewed in the world. For example, having a chaotic sea god may mean the sea is viewed as dangerous and scary, whereas a lawful sea god may imply that the sea is viewed as something that has specific rules that you'll be safe in as long as you follow. It may not seem that an alignment is that important normally, but for gods it can be a great source of world building, so I greatly encourage you to look at it. The third point that is worth considering is how much the god actually interacts with the players or the world in general. Some gods may appear often to travellers or adventurers, whereas the others may stay in the shadows, preferring not to interfere. Both of these are perfectly acceptable traits to give your gods, and you might even have both types in your pantheon. It's just important that you have a good idea of how each god acts. We'll come back to the ways god can influence a campaign at the end of the video, as I hope to give you some ideas. The final thing to think about when it comes to creating your own gods in D&D is the followers and their rituals. How do these people who worship this particular deity act in their worship? This could be floating temples to the sea god, or extremely pretty followers of the god of beauty. Whatever this ends up being will influence how your players interact with followers of that particular religion, and how the followers of that religion interact with your story. Overall, if you can cover these four things relating to your homebrew gods, then you should be able to create fulfilling religions throughout your world. In a weird way, it is also the same four things that you should think about when you create a cult, although specifically that is on a smaller scale with specific demons and devils, so that is a bit of a different vibe. Finally, let's have a think about how these gods could impact the story or how they could impact your players as they go through the story. Some gods may have the idea that they are not to interfere with their players in any way, shape or form. They will spend some time maybe giving guiding dreams, but that would be about the extent of their intervention. However, there are some gods who like to send avatars or to even appear to the players in order to give them advice, guidance or magic items if they are really feeling generous. Therefore, I think it is worth having a variety of these throughout your campaign and make it so that maybe you don't know which gods are going to be a bit more active and which gods aren't, therefore to give a bit of spice to the campaign as you go on. And maybe it turns out a god that you hadn't even considered ends up being an unlikely ally. And there we have it. Let me know if you have any further questions in the comments below, and I will try to make a video in the future that covers some of those answers. The only thing to point out is that some people may disagree with me on some of the points I've made today, and that is absolutely fine. 
D&D is all about taking the basics and making it your own, in my opinion. So if you have any different advice, please do leave it in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Ta-ra.